And that's what climate change is about. It is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. The ability of CO2 to do the heavy work of creating a climate catastrophe is almost nil at this point. The price of oil has been artificially elevated to the point of insanity. That's not how you power a modern industrial system. The ultimate goal of this renewable energy you know, plan is to reach the exact same point that we're at now. You know who's tried that? Germany. Seven straight days of no wind for Germany. Uh, their factories are shutting down. They really do act like weather didn't happen prior to like 1910. Today is Friday. It is Friday, you little twit. We're ready to talk about climate again, and we're going to talk about it in a kind of a different way. This is a somewhat different topic podcast than what we normally cover. We're going to talk about pipelines and trains and eco-terrorism and idiot government response and other things associated with the events of this past week related to uh, derailments and disasters and so forth and so on. With us today is our usual team of experts. We have Linnea Lucan, who is with us today, who's going to talk about uh, some of the things she's discovered about uh, oil and pipelines and accidents and so forth. And of course, Dr. Sterling Burnett is with us, who's in the middle of oil-rich Texas, who I'm sure has some enlightening opinions to tell us today. So the first thing we want to start with is the big disaster this week that's been on everyone's mind. You know, there's been this uh, fantastic explosion from a derailment um, that put out all kinds of noxious chemicals in Ohio. Now let's go to the video and you can see what happened there. And then we're going to talk about that. This massive explosion that happened uh, in Ohio from a train derailment basically just decimated this town. And worse than that, vinyl chloride, which is what was in those tank cars, is now floating downstream. There's atmospheric models of the plume that's going to affect people downstream for breathing and the deposition on cars, all kinds of stuff. It's just a massive disaster. And yet the EPA and the Biden administration is treating this like, well, no big deal. Uh, it, it's just kind of, it's crazy because, you know, some of the responses they have to minor environmental concerns, you know, like climate change, which really doesn't affect you today, seem to be completely over the top compared to the response that they have for this, which is almost a non-response. We just heard just a few minutes ago that Ohio applied for federal disaster relief to get this toxic spill and the wreck and everything under control and was denied by the Biden administration. What is going on? What do you yeah. guys think about this? If if the Biden administration had granted disaster relief, it would have been admitting it was a disaster, <laughs> which they have. Is, you know, it actually happened last week in, in Ohio. I've heard another one happened outside of Detroit recently that they didn't have to blow up. Um, but, uh, you know, look, rail derailments happen a lot more often uh, and accidents happen a lot more often than people realize. Uh, I met a few a, a couple of guys from uh, one of the major railroads a few years ago. Uh, we were traveling together and we got into a conversation that said, oh, yeah, there are dozens across the country every every day. Uh, so they're not rare. This uh, ma this magnitude of derailment is real rare. It didn't explode. It was controlled burned. This was the decision by the governments of, to how to handle the waste, actually. And um, <laughs> uh, so. The uh, Pete Buttigieg is out on the trail um, everywhere but Ohio, everywhere, everywhere but Ohio, uh, touting their uh, record improvements in infrastructure uh, under the Biden administration and talking not about derailments and the dangers of that. But uh, in fact, he didn't even mention it until the 14th. So days after, uh, even though he had multiple speeches. Uh, but talking about equity and how in uh, in transportation infrastructure development, he notices that there aren't enough uh, uh, people of color doing the construction work. So equity was his concern while uh, toxic gases burn. It wasn't just vinyl chloride. There's about seven. Each car had se separate 
chemicals. Uh, some of them were vinyl chloride. Some of them for, were uh, various other chemicals. Uh, and and the EPA uh, head of the EPA, uh, you'd think he'd be right on top of this. He's the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. And instead, he's going around the country also talking about equity and how they're putting money to uh, bring equitable climate solutions around the country. He's an empty shirt. Uh, he, uh, he, he, he hardly, it's, it's not at all fair to call him Johnny on the spot because he's Johnny nowhere to be seen. Um, and this is their reaction is, is we've got to be concerned about equity. I, I suppose maybe the cleanup uh, will make sure that uh, there are uh, proportional representation of uh, different uh, racial composition of the people doing the cleanup because uh, that's what's important to them, not uh, helping the people of Ohio. You know, pets are dying. Uh, the EPA says, oh, it's OK. You can go back home uh, now to be clear. I don't know whether people are being made sick by this stuff. It's, it's just amazing. Deaths are due to the chemical spill. It could just be yeah. coincidence and correlation. But really, do you think so? This is incredible to me because just a couple weeks ago, we were talking about how PM 2.5 and other microparticulates from burning on a gas stove are dangerous to your health and that we need to ban them because of it. But the government, you know, safety data sheets or whatever say burn these materials if it, you know, gets outside of containment and they do. And then they just are kind of like, eh, you know, it'll be fine. I'm sure it's fine. Don't worry about don't worry about breathing in vinyl chloride particle fumes. Um, it's natural gas from your stove. That's the problem. Yeah, you know, it's just amazing the response or the non-response here. Sterling pointed out they're more worried about equity. And this this equity thing is just crazy. Now, first, before we get into that more, I want to talk about the downstream effects of this thing. We have a picture here from a tweet that shows what's been happening to vehicles downstream. But, oh, here we go. Here's the picture, the cartoon. Well, whatever. <laughs> We've got this fantastic cartoon from Gary Varvel from Creators who posted it up on um town hall the other day. Don't worry, I'll make sure our cleanup crew doesn't have too many white guys in it. That's uh, our transportation secretary, Buddy Gang. That, that, can, that, 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 that cartoon is, is grossly inadequate, I inaccurate because Booty Gig was nowhere near this when uh, he, he, you well, know, yeah, you have he, a point. He got a burning thing in the background. He was in another state. He had no desire to be near it. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, now, here's some of the effects that have happened downstream. Um, we've got cars that are getting coated with all kinds of noxious chemicals. You know, we've got all kinds of, of stuff happening downstream, like acid rain in the past, but even worse, because this is full of nasty chemicals combined with the burn, as well as the chemicals themselves. And so we've got all this noxious stuff going downstream that people are going to have to breathe in, get washed off their vehicles, their homes, and so forth. It's almost as if by burning this, they created a bigger environmental disaster than if they just simply left it alone and worked on cleanup. What do you guys think? Yeah, and what, what TM Willems says in the comments here, and I think that... Um, She's probably right, is that they decided to burn it so they could clear the tracks to get drains through. And I don't doubt that that's true. Um, they want to keep it moving. They don't want to have a major line plugged up. But, man, this seems to be a huge mistake. And we don't know what the long-term effects of this are going to be. You know, there's people who are saying, like, oh, everyone in that area is going to be dying for decades. We're going to have all this problem with the farm, you know, any kind of farming that goes on there, blah, blah, blah. And I, I hesitate to jump full on to that level um, because we just don't know. Um, we haven't seen something quite like this before, but we, uh, we're going to have to, you need a federal response for something like this because of that potential. Um, it is really frightening and especially since a lot of those tributaries and the rivers around there connect to some pretty major rivers like um bob here is saying that the ohio flows into the mississippi i don't know how likely it is that it would go west quite that far but um we don't know Probably and not. that's a huge problem 
Yeah. yeah. We generally I, uh... have prevailing winds in that area that don't go west. I want to show you this picture real quick before we get back to Sterling. of uh, A photo taken from an airplane. That black spot there is the plume. That is what actually was going up after they set the thing on fire and it exploded. It's reaching up into the stratosphere. My goodness, it's like a volcanic eruption of nasty chemicals. And yet somehow there's just like no response. Oh, we don't need an emergency declaration for Ohio or assistance. We don't need that. No, not at all. It, it, the, the government response of this is just disturbing, really, truly disturbing. Sterling? Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know if it's more dangerous what they did than uh, than the cleanup they would have had to do. Let's face it, these chemicals would spill, they'd soak into the soil, they'd spend months digging soil uh, out of the ground, trying to get all these chemicals. Uh, in the meantime, they may be leaching into waterways, uh, underground reservoirs. I don't know what uh, what poses a higher risk. Uh, where the dangers, the relative dangers might have lied. Uh, but what we do know is, A, most of these chemicals are in everyday use, and they aren't dangerous when used as, you know, on the box that says, when used as directed, right? <laughs> right. Uh, when, 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 uh, when vinyl chloride is, is in the PVC pipes, it's not a danger to us. Uh, right. You have to other... be careful. You have to be careful when you, when you launch into, um, you know, kind of not fear mongering, but justifiable terror over something yeah. like this that happens. It's justifiable to be afraid, but we do need to think about, you know, exposure and dosage. This isn't like Chernobyl or something. Yeah, um, and people are kind of acting like it's like you, Chernobyl. Yeah, you gotta, uh, but, you know, one of the things that they are talking about might've been on the train is benzene. And benzene can be a carcinogen in the right amounts. And there was actually recently a recall of sunscreen products because the propellant had above the dosage of benzene that they were supposed to have in it. Um, and they had a whole recall on it. Um, in reality, would that amount of benzene in a sunscreen can, you know, give you cancer over time? I don't know. I kind of doubt it. Uh, the EPA tends to err on the side of caution for that kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, well, and sometimes to an excessive amount. Um, so it's a, it's a complicated discussion. It's obviously a ecological disaster in that area. Um, as the immediate effects, you can see, you know, pets dying. Um, I've heard that there have been a lot of chickens that have died because chickens, like if you spray a can of hairspray near them, they <laughs> collapse dead. They're pretty sensitive really? to respiratory problems. Um, yeah, you can't like paint. She ran on her chicken. Yeah, <laughs> no, no. But I had to do a bunch of research about what kind of paint I could use inside of the barn that they're in because uh, paint fumes can kill them. Like they just send Teflon on pans will kill birds. If you are cooking on Teflon pans um, or you run the cleaning operation on uh, like an oven, um, as my someone I know has experienced, that can kill birds that are inside of the house. Um so they're they're sensitive and this is a problem and it needs to be at least they need to say something about it. <laughs> They've been so closed lipped about what exactly they're going to do to fix it, what exactly they're going to do to test and to monitor to make sure that these chemicals are not in deadly quantities in the soil and in the water. Um, they're going to have to really convince people who live in that area and downwind and downstream of that area that they're doing adequate monitoring so that they don't have to be afraid or so that they know that they should move away from there or be, you know, concerned about it. And if that yeah. is the case, then we really should be hearing a lot more about this. Yeah. Look, yeah. We, we, for all the chemicals, every one of them, in fact, items in everyday use, the, the cup of coffee that I'm drinking right now today Dose makes the poison. If you listen to California, every one of these things is a carcinogen uh, and can <laughs> kill us. Uh, you, you look at the EPA's dose response uh, test, you know, uh, some of the Superfund site tests, they talk about, uh, well, if, if, a, if a small child uh, sat there and ate a teaspoon of dirt every day for 70 years, he could develop cancer. That's the dose that talk, they're talking about. I don't know many small children that stay small children for 70 years and eat teaspoons of dirt. 
Uh, but uh, the point is, any of these chemicals could be dangerous if you get them in the um, in a wrong pathway. You absorb, you know, you get them uh, not through normal use, uh, but you know, a large explosion with gas right near your home. That's probably not a good thing anytime, anywhere. Um, so you're right, Linnea. The EPA needs to be more transparent. These are all chemicals that they regulate. Uh, none of these chemicals are chemicals that they don't regulate. But they're like the Wizard and the Wizard of Oz. Ignore the, the disaster behind the curtain over here. I'm telling you it's okay. Why? And I think we should get into the the possibilities of the why, because you look at the company involved who didn't bother to show up at the town hall. Uh, you look at the owners of the company involved, you know, the biggest uh, shareholders in Norfolk Southern are, well, BlackRock, Vanguard, uh, other big companies that are behind ESG that are very concerned about climate change and being right environmentally, but they don't send their rep, you know, they, 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 they're not represented. The big media companies, CBS, ABC, the big, the, the old, the old guard, big three, let's face it. Most people don't get their news from them anymore, but the old guard, big three, they cover a little bit, but they don't hammer Norfolk Southern. They don't ha hammer the politicians and it goes away pretty quickly. Uh, they are playing into it. And who is, who are on their boards as, top three or top five shareholders in ABC, CBS, and NBC, same, same cabal of uh, investment bankers, BlackRock, Vanguard, uh, uh, the, and the others, right? So um, it may not be a cover-up, but there's a reason that many people feel like the perception is they're covering something up. They're not, because, it's simply because they're not on the ground doing things right. The guys that yeah. would normally be, if it was an offshore oil spill, do you think for a second uh, Michael yeah, Reagan would, wouldn't have been flying overhead in a helicopter saying, this is a disaster. We've got to do something. Uh, yeah. We just had a report from a commenter, uh, if we can bring that back up, that he was in East Palestine today. And uh, there you go. It says, most of the information about this derailment is incorrect. Contrary to what we're being led to believe, the response is large scale and ongoing. So what we either have here is uh, a combination of things. Perhaps the government is cracking down on information dispersal and not allowing the media access. And so we're not getting the full story. And so that might be part of what's going on here. But this whole thing kind of leads us into the next topic. And this next topic is there's been an ongoing debate an argument uh, from environmentalists that say we should not be using pipelines. You know, the Keystone Pipeline was like poison to these folks. They were just out to kill that thing from day one. Well, the oil's going to go to market no matter what out of Canada. There's just no stopping it. So what happens? It goes on uh, train cars, oil cars. And of course, Warren Buffett benefited from that tremendously. But here's the thing. If you look at the statistic related to accidents, and Linnea prepared this fantastic graph here, oil pipelines are by far the safest way to transport petroleum. Railways are almost four times more likely to have an accident. And over the road, you know, oil trucks, tanker trucks, they're even worse. There's even more accidents of those. So the point is, an oil pipeline is the safest, most ecologically sound way to transport petroleum products and other types of chemicals. And yet the environmental left is absurdly opposing these things. Yeah. Linnea? Sure. Um, yep. So it's not hard to find this data. It is all over the place. So when people are saying that pipelines are some kind of a environmental danger, uh, it's pretty easy to pull up uh, Department of Transportation data on not just the number of accidents, um, you know, from derailments and such from trains, which is, thank you, uh, right here. You can see that there, I mean, it's much better than it used to be. Back in 1975, there were 6,000 derailments in a single year. That's wild. And today it's about 1,300 um, or thereabouts. So, We've done better. Good job, team, I guess. Um, not that our wonderful um, transportation secretary has done any of that. Um, <laughs> but the uh, but the reality is, is that 
anything that is a moving, you have to, most of the issues with oil spills um, related to railroads and to trucks, it's not necessarily that they're getting derailed and spilling over all the time, but any time that you change the container or move the container, there is an elevated risk. So you have these big tanks that you carry the petroleum product in and you have to book, get them onto the train or or have a preloaded train of tanks and pump the oil into it. That is a hazard zone. Most of the time when you are going to be at risk of a spill, it is going to be when you are transferring the oil from one container to another. Now, what the people who hate pipelines will say is that, oh, well, if you have a pipeline, um, you know, if a pipeline is shipping, you know, what was it going to be with uh, Keystone? It was going to be something like 83,000 or 830,000 barrels a day or something like that. Um, somewhere around there, I think. Um, they'll say, well, if a hole breaks in the pipeline, then you're dumping, you know, tens of thousands of barrels of oil into the landscape instead of however much a train car can hold. Well, that is not how pipelines work. And that's usually not what happens. Um, pipelines have um, safety set safety features that allow them to be shut in around the area of the leak. You can detect a leak relatively quickly in a modern pipeline based on the pressure differential between different sensors along the pipeline. Um, thank you, Abel. Uh, and it is, see, I was pretty close. That's pretty good. Um, <laughs> pretty good for off the top of my head. Um, they, it is, it is much more rare for any kind of a spill to happen from a pipeline as a truck or a train. And environmentalists like to target oil trains and coal trains and stuff too. There's all these stories about environmentalists pouring concrete over the tracks to derail trains. And when this Ohio thing first happened, I was like, oh no, <laughs> it's going to be one of those. So I'm happy that it wasn't one of those, um, one of those occasions, but it, that happens extremely frequently, like shockingly. So Linnea could have added to her graphic um, because we know that under Biden, our imports of oil have gone way up. Uh, they had gone down under Trump. Uh, we get those through tankers and tankers are another source of oil spills and particularly, but not solely at the point of, uh, as, as she said, uh, transition when you're popping it off the tanker or, or topping the tanker up. And uh, they produce much more oil spills, you know, you know, per volume uh, than pipelines. Pipelines are far and away the safest way of shipping oil and natural gas and, and other chemicals. That's, that's just, there's no, uh, there's no data whatsoever that refutes that. Yep. Uh, and the thing and is, it, it's motion. It, it's all motion and gravity based, as Linnea pointed out. You know, you put stuff up in an elevated tank car. Well, gravity is going to eventually win somewhere. You know, we end up with uh, a situation where, you know, the tank car falls over because something's wrong with the tracks. Well, you know, the pipeline is not in motion itself. The transport mechanism is not in motion like it is with rail cars or trucks or whatever. What we've got is the oil moving through the transport mechanism as opposed to the transport mechanism moving. And that's the huge difference. You know, when stuff's in motion, it has a tendency to, to you know, to coin a phrase, run off the rails. It does. And uh, that's the big problem. And it, it, environmentalists can't seem to get that through their heads. I, but I'm not convinced they don't get it through their heads. I think that they just don't care that 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 their goal is to shut down industrial civilization. They want fewer people. They want uh, fewer technologies. They want to end the use of fossil fuels. And so why, you know, they're not going to tout the safest. They're going to put it on the least safe so that when accidents happen, say, they can then say, oh, see, there's no what safe way of using oil and gas. Um, this is intentional on their part. This is not ignorance or stupidity. Um, <laughs> yeah. The environmentalists are so, um, their egos are so large that they believe that their way is the only way. And so they're willing to basically 
uh, you know, trample on the rights of everyone else, basically, to get their way. They don't care. And as we saw in those pictures that Andy had up before, eco-terrorism is rampant on all kinds of different aspects of society. You know, I in my own town of Chico, California, where I used to live, we had an environmentalist try to set an auto dealership on fire. A new auto dealership was being built, and they tried to set it on fire because autos are bad. That's the kind of dim-witted thinking these folks seem to have. Here's some pictures showing exactly what Sterling was talking about. These folks don't want a modern industrial society. They want to go back to nature. They want everybody to live in mud huts, you know, except for them. They live in opulence, you know, people like Al Gore and uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and John Kerry and uh, St. Greta all seem to have opulent lifestyles, but tell us we should be doing things like eating bugs, you know, instead of steak. Yeah. Um, makes Earth, me wonder, are, are bugs sensitive to hairspray? <laughs> Earth first old motto was back to the Pleistocene. That's, you know, that's really what a lot of their thinking is. You know, that's why they, they promote population control. And, you know, in their, in their honest moments, they'll tell you population is the real problem. We've got too many people. Uh, some of them have said as, as few as 200 million people is the ideal human population on earth. They call us, uh, you know, they call humans cancers, uh, exempting themselves. Of course, they're the good cells attacking the cancer. Uh, they call us, uh, parasites. Basically they, uh, they ignore technologies that help the environment and promote technologies that, um, destroy the environment because they, what they really want is people to say, oh, well, we've got to protect the environment. So we got to get rid of all, all these technologies. It's not, it's not a matter of continuing to live the way we 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 live with new technologies that are cleaner you know it's not that they think solar and wind can really replace coal and natural gas and and nuclear they want the system to fail so we live with less we we live like my relatives in venezuela with rationed electricity um it, that's that's what they're really hoping for because that will make it harder and harder make it harder to live and encourage people not to have children because what we've really got to do, according to them, is uh, reduce the human population and reduce consumption. Yeah. Right. And the, ahead, um, yeah, one of the things I, I wanted to point out too, because Andy mentioned this before, is that the goal of the green technology or the renewables technology people is just to get us to the point where we already are with matching consumption to uh, production of electricity. But Sterling is right. That's not what they're trying to do. The plan, and when and it's disturbing to read because a lot of people just shrug it off. Um, a lot of engineers are totally okay with this. They say, well, yeah, but the point is, is that we consume less. Well, what does that mean? You know, there are, there are hundreds of millions of people that don't have reliable access to electricity, medical care, um, uh, safe and healthy drinking water or the ability to use some kind of a, you know, chemical or mechanical filtration to make enough drinking water that's safe for their communities. Um, and they want us to decline from that point in terms of energy use. I don't, I don't know, you know, obviously it's a, you know, kind of, um, not kind of, but it is an anti-human perspective, like Sterling said, it's they not all of the people who consider themselves environmentalists have made this kind of end zone connection here. Um, and that's part of what it's our job to point out is that what you are asking for is misery globally, um, with the exception of a select elite. Right. Let's yeah. Oh, let's see what's he doing going here. So one of the one of the things that came out of this derailment in uh, in Ohio is that they're running for cover now. The ESG folks that you know are promoting this ESG nonsense now. Oh gosh, one of our companies went kablooey, you know, and that's not good for ESG. So let's run for cover. Uh, it, it's so hypocritical. Um, you know, they just 
as long as they're on point with the message, that seems to be all they care about. At least that's my opinion. And the message is, is that everybody has to conform. Everybody has to use less. Everybody has to be putting the benefit of climate and the environment ahead of themselves. And it's just, it's just crazy. Yeah, we can understand why the, um, why the private companies that are involved in this, <laughs> they're running for cover, right? <laughs> It's, it's not a PR win for them uh, and, and stock prices take a hit. So we can understand that, but it doesn't make it right. Uh, it certainly doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't absolve them from uh, the policies that they promote that lead to disasters like this and the cover-ups that lead to inadequate treatment. Now, one gentleman keeps saying, well, they're on the ground, they're on the ground doing stuff. And they are, but they're also telling people they can go back home. They're also telling people, move back in. It's all safe, even though we've got dozens of people spending lots of money cleaning up. Well, maybe it's not all safe yet. You're not you, you haven't given them the all clear. Um, and, you know, private companies have their incentives, but government is supposed to look. The EPA was created not just to prevent pollution, but to uh, clean up pollution, to make things safer and i don't agree uh look i'm i'm a free marketeer i'd like to get rid of the epa as anything but an informational agency now and let the states handle their things but this is interstate commerce the federal government has a role and for buddha gig to i mean not buddha gig uh, reagan in this instance to be flying everywhere but to ohio uh to be talking about everything but toxic train derailments uh, especially focusing on climate change, you know, long-term future harms, talking about equity concerns, because that's become the centerpiece of uh, Biden's environmental concern is environmental justice. Everything but its core function, it was funded to do a particular thing, clean up the environment, not to be equitable in how it cleans up the environment, not to worry about uh, phantom risk 100 years in the future, but to worry about things that are affecting people today. And while their workers may be on the ground doing it, the leadership is abs are absent without leave. Same thing with the Department of Transportation and Buttigieg. Talking right. about everything until, until the media pressure or pressure from people like us, I don't know if we can take credit, but we keep hammering them on it. Finally, a week after the spill, comes out with his own statement. Uh, <laughs> it's like, well, hold it, you know. Do your job. And your job is not uh, making sure people do an EIS to account for climate risk of emissions 100 years from now, but preventing emissions of real toxics today. Yeah, they seem to be more interested in all of the associated messaging associated with, you know, their movement as opposed to fixing the actual problem. That, that, and that seems to be the case of government lately in, in all aspects. They're all more about the narrative and more about the appearances, more about the messaging, more about the optics than they are about solving problems. And it's, it, that's a disaster in and by itself. Yeah, well, and, and a good example of this is the Superfund site issue, right? And Sterling knows a lot about this, probably a lot more than I do. But um, And whether or not you like Trump is not the point on this one, but under Trump's administration, they cleaned up more Superfund sites than I think any other presidential administration ever, because he looked at it as, what's the EPA's job? Clean up these things? Okay, do that. Your job is yeah. to do that. That's and then they exactly went right. and they did it <laughs> and they yeah, did, they concept. didn't waste all of their time, you know, doing all these like cutesy press conferences where they talk about, you know, turtle straws and stuff. Although <laughs> that wasn't, <laughs> uh, they're not wasting all the time in the world doing that. They, they might have a select few people that go to the forefront and, you know, do their little PR stories and stuff. But in the background, they had a bunch of people actively working to clean up these toxic and dangerous uh, sites, including old landfills that needed their um, like underlayerment stuff repaired and all that good, all that good stuff. Um, and they were just getting it done, just like 
ticking them off the list. And then we get into the Biden administration, who is supposedly the environmental, the climate people, blah, blah, blah. And that super fund rate drops again. They do not care about the environment. Yeah, they care about whether or not their message is going to advance their cause, their power, and their control. No, they, they, don't, they, they, they don't care about doing their core functions because their core functions, for the most part, not entirely, but look, the air is much cleaner. The water is much cleaner. Toxic chemical releases are much lower. They've actually... Uh, with the help of state agencies and private industry uh, um, technological developments, innovation, they've actually succeeded in doing the things they were constructed to do. So they're constantly seeking new functions, new justifications for ever greater budgets and ever more employees. So they've got to go after less and less direct risks, more phantom risk, more, you know, Things in the future, right. things that might, we can imagine through computer modeling, mind you, that this might happen sometime. So that's what right. we've got to regulate. Or just basically telling people day to day how, what's best for them when they use energy in appliances. So look, does anyone really believe the founders or even the EPA, or the Department of Energy, when they were founded, the, the people that founded these things said, what we really need to do is to tell people how much water they use in their toilet. <laughs> what we really what we really need to do is to tell people how much energy their air conditioner should use. And if they don't and because they're too stupid to know what's best for them, we will regulate the appliances that work for them that are cheapest out of existence and tell them, well, in the long run, you're saving money. Well, yeah, right. but I don't have an air conditioner today. In the long run, if I could afford it, I would save money, but I'll have to live without an air conditioner uh, for quite a while to save money for that expensive air conditioner that you've now, because it's I a vicious can't cycle. the once. Yeah. It's a vicious cycle. The more regulation they put on to things like home appliances, the more expensive they get and the more expensive electricity becomes, you know, because of the greenness of it. You know, there's a parallel to all of this. Let's not touch this thing because cleaning up stuff is yucky. We don't want to do that. Let's computer model it and figure out what the future will be. That's the same kind of insanity that goes on with the weather stations around the world that I have been looking at for years. You know, they don't want to go out and actually fix these weather stations, the ones that are in the middle of freaking parking lots. No, we're going to come up with a statistical adjustment to the data so that we can filter that out. Well, that's absolute BS. With a 96% corruption rate, which is what I discovered in my study this last summer, of weather stations around the United States, you can't filter that out. That is the majority of the data. And the majority of the data is overheated. And yet they say they can filter it out. Well, that's absolute hogwash. But you know what? Come to ICC 15 coming up next week and you'll see something <laughs> that we're going to do about that. Just watch. That's a really good plug, Anthony. <laughs> that Thank was you. seamless. Uh, but yeah, Sterling, but what you were saying, it's even worse than that. Because studies by the EPA themselves have come out and said that the Energy Star stuff is a total failure, that you don't save any money on these appliances after all, because they break at a much higher rate than yep. the other appliances do. And all and especially all these, you know, I was complaining about it to a friend of mine this morning. Um, all these like refrigerators that have all the special integrated computer chips so that it can nag you about what you don't, you don't have enough milk left in your refrigerator or whatever it happens to be. All of that stuff is extra stuff to break, and it does. And now they're pushing these um, extra energy efficient washing machines and dishwashing machines. And my darn Energy Star dishwasher already doesn't wash dishes. <laughs> it doesn't work. It's terrible. Trump even so talked about this. So you run it twice, this. right? Yeah. No, no, <laughs> Trump look. even talked about how awful the Energy Star appliances are on the campaign trail, and the elites laughed at him. But this look. is the kind of stuff that we have to deal with all the time, is that the darn dishwasher doesn't work the way it's supposed to. And there is no way that it is more efficient to run an Energy Star appliance twice than it is to uh, just run a good one once. There's just no right. way. Uh, yeah, the, the Energy Star example, appliance... Uh, I'm sorry, but... The I'm sorry. Go ahead, Sterling. The Energy Star appliance uh, that I have, it's not just that maybe you have to run it multiple times. Uh, that's a combination of their water use, uh, the way the way the, the water jets work, and the uh, chemicals they took out of soaps, uh, phosphates. Um, 
but they run for hours. Look, my old dishwasher ran for an hour and the dishes came out clean. Now it's three hours. Uh, and I've had to replace in uh, recent years, my air conditioning unit and my, uh, my washing machine and my dryer. Now, the air conditioning unit that I replaced, no one, no one's telling me that my current unit will get this use. The air conditioning unit I replaced, and it may be unique, <laughs> was in the house for over 25 years. It's actually, I think, 27 years. My washing machine was more than 30 years old when I replaced it. My wife was very happy. Uh, my dryer uh, was older than that. Uh, now their, their functions, you know, it, they were not functioning as well at the end and we got rid of them. But do you think the new dryers and washers are going to last that long? My new washer broke in its first year. Um, and my mother's living with appliances that are that old too, and they're still working. So, uh, you add a lot of technologies, you regulate energy usage and flows of water. And you make things work less effectively and cost more to repair, uh, break more often. And so you never capture that. You know, look, when I, the first time I really looked at sort of appliance standards, I was working for a different organization and it was the light bulb, right? We got, we had to replace the incandescent light bulb. And one of the arguments is, oh, well, you, you waste a lot of energy and heat. Well, that heat heats homes and things. So uh, okay, that keeps my heater from running as often as it would. But there's some virtually signaling states that just jumped on the bandwagon. Oh, we got to do that. And they didn't think it through. So in Minnesota, they immediately replaced a lot of, in some, in some towns, they replaced their uh, traffic lights with, um, with uh, LEDs. Uh, and LEDs don't get hot. So, you know, they, they don't, don't have that waste heat. But they also don't melt ice and snow during the winter, which is what the old light bulbs did. So they suddenly discovered they were having accidents at intersections during snowstorms <laughs> and ice storms because no one could see the lights. And so their solution was not to go back to the old incandescent, but to add very expensive equipment that artificially heated the lights, requiring more electricity to keep them clear. That's the government fix. Yeah. Create a problem that didn't exist before and then solve it with a more expensive solution than just going back to the old issue. Right, because they can never admit they were wrong. Never. I, I want to point out that the most epic failure of government exists not in washing machine, but in the gas can. How many of you out there have had to deal with these monstrosity gas cans? This was started in California because, oh my God, emissions from the gas can might get into the atmosphere. So they came up with this insane nozzle, this nozzle that doesn't work. It just doesn't work. You try to fill it. Let, let's say you're stranded and you try to fill your car with a gas can or fill a lawnmower or whatever, some kind of a, you know, a yard device, a little chainsaw, anything. And you try to use this gas can to, and you have to push this nozzle to release it. The problem is, is that you spill gas all over the place. And so instead of, you know, curbing emissions, you're, you're spreading them all over the place. It's created a whole new black market for you know, black market gas can nozzles. You can buy them on eBay. And I'll, I'll admit, I've done it because the government sponsored, you know, uh, you know, environmentally approved gas can nozzle is a complete and total epic disaster. And yet they won't admit that. They won't fix it. You're still required to buy that stupid nozzle on any gas can you buy. And most people these days that are in the know just take those things off, throw them away, and replace it with a black market gas can nozzle. Well, this, just... you know, the same thing happened with toilets decades ago when they first re regulated toilets. What people started doing was going to old trailer homes and ripping out the old plumbing. And when they replaced their toilet, uh, replaced it with that uh, rather than the low flow, the low flow. So it's saving you money on water toilets. Well, unless you're flushing multiple times and it breaks and you have to replace parts. So they, they, they would go into old trailers, uh, you know, uh, that, that people had abandoned or were trashing or <laughs> something, you know, or, or they bought for a couple of thousand dollars, but then they ripped out all the toilets from the trailer 
and installed <laughs> high flow five gallon tank toilets in their home uh, <laughs> because they actually wanted there toilets you go. to work. Get a really Imagine good that. expensive plunger and keep it close by. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Proactively double flush. Oh, yeah. Goodness, goodness. It's you know, but all because the government knew how much water we should be using. They knew best. Uh, as opposed to the government has no business telling me how much energy I use, how much water I use, so long as I'm willing to pay for it. So so long as I pay the bill, I, I should be the one to making that decision. Local governments, I go to them, I vote for councilmen, I vote for bond issues. If we want more water and to use more water and we're willing to pay for that, that should be our business. The federal government has no role in telling us I've read the Constitution. The words energy efficiency appear nowhere in there. Right. Right. So it boils down to this. Every time government gets involved in something, whether it's a train rail disaster, whether it's the environment, whether it's chemicals, whether it's gas cans, appliances, electricity use, electricity generation, they tend to have a they tend to screw it up. It's just simple as that. I mean, uh, you, you know, you go look at the DMV. The DMV is a personification of government waste and inefficiency in just about every state. Not every state. Some states, like Idaho, have fantastic DMVs that'll get you in and out in 20 minutes or less. Other states, like California, you have to schedule weeks ahead. And then when you get there, and I've done this through experience, you have to wait as much as two hours for your appointment. It's called a reservation for a reason. Oh, well. All right, enough ranting. Let's get to some of the questions that we have that have come up uh, that our producer Andy has gotten. Bring up some of those. Okay, so how about the EPA endangerment finding regarding lithium ion batteries and EVs? I'm not familiar with this. Are you guys? Oh, well, I think it's it's sarcasm on his part. There is no endangerment finding on electric vehicles and uh, lithium ion batteries. His, his point is uh, they're worried about... Uh, uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, natural gas, and they're not worried about things that are actually catching fire and burning down homes and, and uh, uh, killing people. Yeah, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. Next question. What else we got? Andy is searching frantically for the question now and getting ready to put it up on the screen so we can respond. And it's going to come up any second now. There it is. And gone. So do any of us think there is a depopulation plan. None of these carcinogens have a normal use. Mm, I don't know. That one's. That's a I guess I'm not sure. I'm not sure what he's saying, actually. Well, the the carcinogens or the the chemicals that are on the train do have a normal use. A lot of normal uses. Um, mm -hmm. Benzene is used in propellants for all sorts of stuff. Um, vinyl wow, chloride so is made in PVC, which your drinking water goes through. Um, certain you know certain grades of it anyway so there are these are all chemicals that are used widely um just you know it's different the exposure is different though you know you don't want to while vinyl chloride in a pvc pipe to to build it might not be any kind of a danger to your health um i wouldn't drink it <laughs> <laughs> I would say. So I think um, a lot of the confusion, and this is mostly the EPA's fault because of the way that they structure their um, anti-pollution kind of philosophy. And a lot of their philosophy is that there is no safe level of almost anything, especially not anything having to do with a petrochemical. Um, the, the fact is, is that exposure and dosage matters. It's the same with any um, any substance, any natural occurring substance on the earth. You know, um, a small amount of, I don't know, eating an apple isn't going to kill you, but the arsenic in the seeds could if you ate enough of them. Uh, that would be hard to do, but <laughs> but the, uh, the point stands. So it, you have to be careful about that. At one time, at, at one time, uh, for a very short period of time, I drank, uh, and this was counted by people because I was getting migraines on the weekends when I wasn't doing it regularly enough. I was drinking 17 cups of coffee a day, uh, two in the morning, uh, about uh, 13 at work, and then two at night about 11 o'clock before I went to bed. Now, had I drank that much coffee every day from the time I was seven till today, 
it's quite likely some of the chemicals in coffee could have caused cancer. Every, almost every chemical tested at high enough doses over long enough periods of time cause some kind of cell deformity that can become cancer. Um, water, God, water's vital to life. Uh, but if you don't take it in right, <laughs> it, it kills you. If you breathe it rather than drink it, and if you drink too much too fast, it kills you. Uh, anything can be dangerous, but these chemicals, like, like Linnea said, look, go buy any new uh, housing development being erected, and you'll see PVC pipes sticking out of the ground. Because what we don't do, typically, we got rid of lead pipes, thank God for that. Uh, we don't use copper pipes, very expensive, better uses for copper. PVC is the replacement. And that's what the, that, that, that liquid that spilled, the majority of it, it was. It's PVC. It was going to a plant to make plastics that are vital to our everyday life. Uh, so I don't think that they're trying to... I know of nobody who has a plan to depopulate the earth. I know a lot of people calling for depopulation of the earth. Now, maybe there's a cabal out there that actually has a plan. Uh, I'm not in all the backroom meetings at the WEF or something like that, uh, but uh, um, I'm not aware of one. And I certainly don't think the way that they would go about doing it is through small doses from plastics. Um, There'd be a lot more efficient ways. But then again, Sterling, the government is not very efficient. <laughs> so maybe they just suck at it. Yeah, maybe. You, you, Linnea, you got me there. Oh, Anthony, you're muted. Whoop, what's going on there? I don't know. He's talking. Anthony, you're muted. His lips were moving. Somehow my mic, somehow my mic keeps getting auto-muted. I don't know. Some technology failure. It could be. It could be something else. I don't know. But uh, so here's the question. Why did Biden deny? And it's gone. <laughs> there we go. Why did Biden deny federal disaster assistance for that actual disaster? There seems to be plenty of cash for climate justice and other things. What do you guys think? It's probably because it would have to go on their record as a um, like a disaster assistance event that had to happen. Um, mm. That's good I, it's not related to climate change. It's not a storm. You know, it's not, it, it may be because it's just not widespread enough in the sense of it doesn't go across multiple counties, though, of course, with the prevailing winds and the drifting water, maybe it will over time. Who knows? But um, I think it's just not there. You know, if it's climate, if it's weather, if it's a weather issue, then we, we all the disaster relief you want. If it's something that they can't tie to what they're concerned about, which is climate change and ESG, then it ain't getting the disaster relief call. Yeah. Yeah. And I think point. that's I think that's about the most charitable position that you could have on why they don't care. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we've pretty well covered rail well, everything. Let's see, we've had in this show, we had a picture from a plane, we've had pictures of trains. We didn't get a picture of an automobile, though, so we're not quite there with planes, trains, and automobiles. But we did talk about all the stuff that powers them and the the way that they want to uh, manage and suppress them. But before we leave, I want to talk about what's coming up next week. If you have not gotten yourself set up to go to this conference yet, please do so. Visit climateconference.heartland.org and talk about or not talk about, but uh, sign up and come visit us in Orlando next week, February 23rd through the 25th, for our climate conference, the true crisis, climate change or climate policy. Well, we've already been talking about climate change. Yes, it happened, but no, it's not a crisis. So it seems to me like climate policy from the government is actually worse than climate change itself. We'll talk about that and many other topics, plus I have a few surprises. Please come to this conference. And of course, next week, we will be broadcasting live from that conference on our YouTube channel. Be sure to tune in for that. We'll provide links to uh, get you into the live session. And of course, they'll be available after the conference with you where you can look at them at leisure. So that kind of wraps up. But what our, we won't uh, be doing, Anthony, what we won't be doing, just to make clear for them, is we'll be broadcasting live from the conference, but we won't have a climate change roundtable next week. That's right. I was just going to get to that. Thank Sorry. you for pointing that out. 
We are not going to be live next week in this venue, but we will have all of our regular presentations going from the conference in our YouTube channel. And we ask you that you tune into those if you can't make it to the conference itself. Linnea will be there. Sterling will be there. I will be there. Lots of other folks will be there, including some legislators and some scientists and other folks that have a real handle on what's really going on with climate change. Okay. For Linnea Lucan and for Sterling Burnett, I am Anthony Watts, Senior Fellow of Environment and Climate for the Heartland Institute, wishing you a good Friday and a good day.